eh, reitero eh, mis saludos a todos. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Good evening, everyone. This is complicated, though. I have the feeling that this conference is, is not ending, and I hope it never ended, because it is so important. It is paramount, actually. It's life-changing. And so I would be to, so happy to have our life develop throughout the discussion, because, again, it's life-changing for the future of humankind. That's the first thing that I would like to do. I have a schedule, so to say, I have a guideline here, but I don't have the time and I don't know what, what topic to pick from all the topics that I want to discuss, and I'll try to summarize, but I only have 15 minutes, I think. But I would like to be thankful and pay a tribute to these people, people who deserve who are worth mentioning. Garzón, it's been said, he is the flagship of universal jurisdiction. It's been said before because of what he's done so far. But there are other people out there that I would like to name. Although I know there are many, I'm not mentioning. First, my colleagues in a situation and a claim against the dictatorship in, in Argentina and Chile, brought uh, to, to trial by the Spanish justice, Manuel Oje, who showed how fond we are of each other, and compared me to Simeone, soccer expert, Jose Luis Calan, the first criminal law lawyer, sorry, Juan Pérez de la Vega Casa, Jaime Sante Bremón, Carmen Lamarca, and I'm forgetting some, 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 some colleagues, probably I'm missing out on, on some of them, but uh, well, most of us are old enough to know that 15 years ago, universal justice was an exotic idea, was not discussed, and yet here we are at a conference with a large audience, large attendance of non-experts and experts in the topic, and also many lawmakers that come and try to consolidate this definition of universal jurisdiction. Back then, we felt we were the army for Brancaleone. We, we didn't have the means, we didn't have the experience. This starts with a claim lodged by uh, Prosecutor Castezano, and when we had a chance to contact him, well, first, we asked how he had dared do something like that, and I always reiterate this is important to understand this. I have, he said that he has always admired the mothers of the Mayor Square, and also he said that he felt there were many Spaniards that had been victims of the Argentinian dictatorship, so he felt it was something was needed, and also, also all the demonstrations against the impunity in 1996 after the anniversary of the coup that had, the military coup that had, that had encouraged him to do something. So he checked Spanish leg legislation, checked it up, and realized, realized as, as Cayambos and Wolfgang Kallex uh, explained, because they discussed this in length, and explained how there were proceedings, some of them are still ongoing in Germany, because some of the victims were of German nationality, the same as France and Italy, which is the principle of nationality or passive personality. But the lawmaker in Spain did not cover the protection of Spanish victims. And still, it became the trigger of universal jurisdiction, because that's when he considered what to do. The only thing he could do was to enforce universal jurisdiction according to Spanish law, but which had not been enforced here or elsewhere. This principle is here in Spain since the end of 19th century. It was included and further defined in 1985, but probably whoever came up with this didn't think 
that it would be so paramount as it ended up being. And so he considered that via this principle that covers several international crimes, second rank, as has been mentioned, he set out what he considers first crime crimes, genocide, which was covered in Spain as an indictable, indictable crime when committed outside of Spain. Then there was this other crime against humanity, which is uh, crimes against humanity like that, which is uh, generally used. Why is that? Because including these crimes into Spanish law was just by adap adoption or adaptation of international law. In the organic law, here in Spain, they cover drug dealing for feature of, um, of currency, naval piracy, prostitution, terrorism. For all those crimes, there were international treaties. But the, until the Rome Statute, there was no regulation of the topic, and only through ad hoc international criminal Courts, but there was not a treaty for crimes against humanity. And this is very important because I heard this question in one of the panels saying that international law tends to be used by the main powers in the planet, the globe, to prosecute those who are to be prosecuted. And so it has become an offensive weapon. But it's just the opposite. Uh, criminal law has made progress thanks to victims, thanks to the fact that new protection standards have been implemented. Of course, there is a world to become good in this regard, but without these standards, we would not be talking about universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction means that international treaties are to be enforceable and that they need to be applied and adopted via amendments, new standards, new treaties into domestic law, and we'll also have international treaties, new international treaties, and where universal jurisdiction is to become mandatory. Uh, right now, I'm still acknowledging other contributions. And then I would also like to appreciate uh, the work of other Spanish judges, such as Garzón, there's no need to congratulate him anymore. But there are other judges in Spain that are worth mentioning. I would like to say three names, but I have a few reservations about one of them, and I'll explain why. When the investigations by Justice Garzón were frozen, the prosecutor appealed the, I mean, crimes under Franco's regime investigation. And this went to the criminal court at the High Court. And there were three judges who said that uh, Carthon was competent for their prosecution. One of them, uh, Jose Ricardo de Pedro Solaiza, could not make it. Another one, Ramon Saez, was there. And another judge who, unfortunately, well, actually opposed the freezing of the prosecution and thought that the High Court were had it under its scope to prosecute. But she was the one that had to speak for the denial of extradition of González Pacheco, so I don't think she is worth my tribute. And I would like to know how she thinks that crimes under Franco's regime are already prescribed. She said that torture as a crime within the context, as firing the squads, so all the freedom were repressed, but still, she thinks that those are not crimes against humanity, and I would like her to explain why. But I would like to extend my gratitude and my tribute to those judges who oppose to the enforcement of this terrible uh, amendment to universal justice and jurisdiction. And this was named and qualified by an MP as an attack to us, malfeasance. It's an offense by the Spanish parliament, the greatest offense, the suppression of universal justice. But those offenses lead to the struggle of Andreu, Pedraz, Ruth, all those judges who are 
ready to react. It is also important, although I won't have the time for this, but there are judges who are willing to measure up and, and, and fight against Franco's, uh, and the crimes committed under Franco's regime. There are many, many judges who are waiting for an opportunity to look into these crimes, crimes under Franco's regime, and they are not doing so because of this terrible sentence from February 2014, a sentence from the court that acquitted Garçon, in a way, but convicted victims to helplessness and at the same time tried to justify that there was no ground for the prosecution investigation of those crimes such as prescription, the amnesty and pardon law. This was important because at a given time they say these crimes could have been considered uh, crimes against humanity now, but when they were committed they were not crimes against humanity. So the principle of legality means that we cannot enforce it. And that's what I say, that we need to say that the prosecution of crimes need to need to be regardless of the time when, it were, when they were committed. Murder, conviction, all kinds of crimes, all kinds of conventions, in all those conventions think that those are in indictable. But what about prescription? The first time it is discussed, it's in 1988, but this is a recent provision from a historical point of view and still has become a jus cogens standard of provision. So it, there's no treaty that can refuse it. It is a mandatory standard. No one can say that the genocide is prescriptible, that expires. Supreme Court convicted a Chilingo, Navy Captain Chilingo, for crimes committed in Argentina against Argentina 20 years, sorry, Schilling, uh, 20 years before Chilingo was indicted here. So what about the topic of prescription? So they were, he was prosecuted for throwing people alive into the sea in uh, 1977, but he was indicted in 1998, so it had been over the, the prescription period or recession period, it's been over 20 years since the crimes. So what's the Spanish court doing? Well, although the crime was not foreseen or included in the Spanish legislation, it is part of a crime against humanity, and so it has to be prosecuted according to universal jurisdiction. Wonderful outcome, but how come it is not being used also for Franco's crimes? Franco regimes, crimes under Franco's regime. Well, there are some judges in high court are fighting for the perseverance of this extraordinary case and they've opened over 15 cases in Spain, 15 claims, because Spain is a pioneer for universal jurisdiction, but actually that's where we get the largest number of cases for universal jurisdiction all over the world. So the question is, why some of the judges that have ruled on the topic, why do they say that crimes and the Falcos regime cannot be investigated? And this, uh, this has been said before, political pressures, um, financial pressure, still acknowledgement. Uh, and, and, and I'm guessing I won't have time for all of them. But uh, I, I think you need to give me some extra time, I guess, because I'm acknowledging the contribution of other people. And then we have Estela de Carlotta. Estela de Carlotta, what else can I say? Many of you, I don't, uh, I don't know you, probably you don't know her. Huh? She's a symbol for the struggle against impunity in Argentina, the same as mothers and grandmothers of the May Square. I think he's, she's here representing all of them. And a question I had, why are there so many Argentinians here? We are three Argentinians uh, here out of five. Well, many reasons for that. In Argentina, there was a, a, a trial against the military juntas uh, led by Moreno Campos, Justice Moreno Campos, who was a prosecutor there. Then in Argentina, we are proud enough to have the mothers and grandmothers of the main square who have led this internationally, which has led to the Convention of the Rights of, uh, of Children's Rights and other conventions, and then DNA tests that also abducted kids and the Franco's regime are claiming. 
stolen kids. Because Argentina was a country where we put an end to impunity. In Argentina, as, as you know, the clean slate this acts and the, 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 the consequent uh, pardons I have been discussed. I think it was Dr. Zaffaroni who said these laws were voted by a democratic parliament. Most of, of those taking a vote voted for those clean slate acts and this has to be taken into account for the amnesty in Spain because they say that one of the arguments is that it was voted by an, a, a democratically elected parliament. It is irrelevant. There is no governor, no policymaker that can issue a pardon because of this. So I think this is important and worth noticing. And, and many more things. Now in Argentina we have over 500 people convicted, prosecuted, trials all over the country. There are many reasons to have this many Argentinians here, especially because Garzón is also in close relation to them because he is held in great esteem there. But why so many Argentinians and deep people here? Because we've been beneficiaries of universal jurisdiction. Well, trials are held because people choose it. But I think that enforcement of universal jurisdiction made it possible for us to have those trials in Argentina. And this is the core reason why so many Argentinian people are interested and have learned so much, as Manuel said yesterday. Because you had not ever even heard the word universal jurisdiction. Well, some lawyers might have wrote down that term and we never thought of how potent and, and, and significant it would be. I have to finish now, right? So I'm, I'm missing many, many acknowledgements and remarks and I know that we never have enough time for these kind of things, but uh, what about I take your time and well, we need the victims to keep fighting. There would be no trial, there would be no lawyers, there would be no justice, because if it weren't for the momentum and the thrust of our society, it has to be real. On the one hand, for universal jurisdiction, and also because the impunity in case of these crimes, it's inadmissible. It cannot be allowed, and the society needs to be in control, and then nobody will stop us trying to guarantee pro protection of our people, persecution of international crimes, in order to achieve universal jurisdiction. It all seemed to be buried in the past, it all seemed to be forgotten, but we find victim associations coming up all over Spain and there are wonderful memorials and wonderful tributes and it's just touching and if you give me two extra minutes, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to talk about Argentina's case in the struggle against Franco's uh, crimes. There will be a panel tomorrow, but it's still just this guy some mention, mention it. And that is the Argentinian judge in Spain. What are the limits to universal jurisdiction? What are the powers of a judge to work in accordance of, uh, with the universal jurisdiction? The territory is the world. If the crime has been committed anywhere in the, in the world, then we need to have the power to intervene. And this was made clear for the first time in history just two, three days ago when a Basque Spanish uh, judge from Guernica authorized the Argentinian judge to take a statement to victims in his court. Look, this is a step forward. Justice Pedras went to Guatemala and authorities in Guatemala didn't allow him to take statements there. But this time, Argentina dared do this for the first time and there's been a judge in Spain who's allowed her to come here. And well, several judges, because she'll be to Seville and Madrid and Valencia, and there she'll take statements to victims of uh, crimes under Franco's regime. Of, well, for a long time, Spanish authorities refused to cooperate they, uh, to, with, this, with Argentina. There were letters of request. There, they 
they, they talk about the principle of subsidiarity, which is terrible for universal jurisdiction. Until recently, this was the case, but there was a time when uh, this wasn't the case anymore. First, when Spanish law discuss Pachecas and Muñecas' tradition. Then, something else that will be news in recent days, in, in upcoming days, that the Argentinian judge, there was this person, victim who is 88 years old and had to travel to Argentina because no one would listen to them here. And he's got his parents' remains in Guadalajara and had to take a flight to Argentina to, to make a statement. There was a letter of request sent to Spain to have the exhumation of the body, of, of the remains, for a trial in Guadalajara, and another letter of request for the High Court to take DN samples from this lady, because the, the, the victim is the lady, and other. Uh, relatives for the identification of the remains. This is before the High Court because the Spanish government referred this. And also the requests for an option to take statements, uh, as it's going to be the case in the Lusso, the Basque country. What does it all mean? Well, the government all of a sudden became a cooperator with justice, which does not mean that it is not being the achievement of the Spanish society itself. It's forced the government to refer these cases to justice because this cannot be like that anymore. This impunity for, for, for victims for over so many years. And so this is a success of the Spanish society and of the Argentinian uh, society. There's a great solidarity in Argentina with this situation. There was a press conference where there were many representatives of human rights associations and they felt touched when this claim was lodged four years ago. And there's, there's several reasons for that. First of all, because most of us, uh, naturally, we feel that we are part of the Spanish Republic and we think this is a result of great experience, but especially for the great benefit that it brought to Argentina, the fact that there was universal jurisdiction exercise here in Spain. I would like to have some principles included. Then, sorry, again, two more minutes. When he was investigating in Spain, Garzón, I mean, there were 50 more cases open, which were very complicated. We are experts in the prosecution. We need people prosecuting criminals. We need the trials. We need the courts. And we need universal jurisdiction with new principles. These principles need to be included, but I think there will be a panel just for this. Thank you very much. I find it very exciting that I can be here because of all the people that are with me and also because how interesting this topic is for so many people that was not known, just not so. You know, giving their opinion about this topic. So now I have a question for Carlos Lepoy. The question is, whenever there is amnesty, and necessary to reach a peace agreement, how could we harmonize this amnesty with the idea of lack of impunity and universal justice? Well, it is a complex question. And actually, this brings us to think, was it necessary to have impunity in Spain? Or, well, what happens with the transition? Did it leave the perpetrators at the under the Franco's regime? Uh, enjoying impunity? Well, actually, it is not possible to make justice if at that time or another, well, sometimes, well, that justice has to be made at any point in time, at any point in time in history. That doesn't mean that, well, I think it is important to say that these, these perpetrators should not be prosecuted only universally. I always say, what would have happened in 25th of March in 1976 in Argentina, where it was obvious that massacres were committed like, on the peoples if universal jurisdiction had been uh, implemented somewhere else outside Argentina? 
probably there have been many, many less casualties than we had in Argentina. What happened if Videla had been prosecuted outside his country? But let us say instead of being prosecuted in 1990, if he had been prosecuted in 1976. I think universal justice can be highly effective for that. We have to launch the message that those crimes have to be prosecuted sometime. Well, um, well, one possible interpretation could be, well, if I'm going to be prosecuted someday, sometime, I will never step down from power. Uh, we hold on to power for as long as possible. So. Whenever, and then it would mean that they are leaving power because they want to do so instead of because they have the social pressure. Of course, we know that there are specific times, so tiny moments to do specific things. So the crimes against humanity must be prosecuted. Let us think that courts anywhere in the world, they fulfill their function when they prosecute crimes. So let us think about that. How is it possible that the most severe crimes that are committed against community are go unpunished? How is it possible for the international community not to articulate anything that helps prosecute this or ensures that these crimes or perpetrators are prosecuted? Previous speaker told us that Hugo Guerrera said that it took 40 or 50 years to have an ICC as it is nowadays. Well, we have enough impetus nowadays to put into place these mechanisms to know that perpetrators will be prosecuted. Dr. Safaroni said, well, he was referring to his age, a really wise man. He said that he disbelieved the prevention. He did not believe on the prevention of uh, genocide. He said that international law had to be enforced. So at this point in time, the lack of value that we have at the universal level is the impunity of the perpetrators. When Pinochet was arrested, a journalist told me, today we are breathing better. Many of us felt so many, so much relief. Many people in the world celebrating that simultaneously because that broke with the paradigm of impunity and that created a new paradigm. So, so it must be known by perpetrators that will be prosecuted because we have to establish that we have to establish those values that are of a universal nature, that being protecting life, protecting women against sexual crimes. We have to protect the victims against these type of crimes. And this is why, well, torture is always inductable. If we know that by torturing a person, this person will tell you where he put the bone to demolish the building, well, is torture legitimate in that case? Well, in all cases, torture has to be prosecuted or indicted. Well, if it was necessary for that person to torture someone else to prevent a superior ill, then that person has to be subjected to justice for justice to rule whether the torture was justified or not, whether it was a question of force majeure or not. So, however, what we cannot admit in any case is that for any reason, whether it is peace agreement, transition, or any other reason, these crimes go unpunished. So, and we have to take that everywhere. And now we are closer. We are closer than what we believe. And now, two more minutes. Well, public prosecutors. Well, I did not acknowledge the Spanish prosecutors. As Mena, well, Mena was mentioned here, well, we had a conference in 1996. Some prosecutors from the union of these prosecutors were opposing this idea of um, investigations in Spain on the dictators, uh, dictatorships on Chile and Argentina. 
when MENA had a wide recognition at that time, hard, uh, f worked really hard to bring this forward. So we had uh, MENA, Villarejo, Dolores Delgado. For a long time, we had a prosecutor that opposed that up until we had well, Dolores showed up. And I'm sure that there will be prosecutors in Spain that will put an end to the impunity for crimes at the Franco's regime. We have to implement jurisdiction all over the world for the crimes that affect. So it was timely to discuss it, but okay, let us just move forward. So question now. So in terms of generating a culture of future uh, free of impunity, so we have to look at back at what happened with impunity in Argentina. In Argentina, many people became to associate themselves with each other. So who would be the key actors, the key players that allowed or enabled to make progress, that progress was made in this regard? So uh, this is a question for Estela, uh, for all of you. And I would like to finish this question and answer session with this question. Who would be, who would be the partners of this fight against impunity? Today, we are witnessing a phenomenon, that is to say victims of Franco's regime come to Argentina to find a judge. At that time, victims of Argentina came to many courts in Europe to find a judge that would listen to them. So the main actors are victims and association of victims. We would have not gotten anywhere without them. So are you talking about the media? Well, when investigations started, Spanish media was saying that Garzón wanted to become the superman of justice that he was looking for power. Many of these media do have no other choice but to admit the fundamental role played by Garzón in universal jurisdiction and in universal law. As Estela said, some regions in Spain are just reflecting the travel, uh, the travel made by the Argentina judges. If you open the national papers in Spain, they ignored that case. Well, we really have to fight against the mainstream or hegemonic uh, media. So this conference is being sponsored by the mainstream paper in this country. So the media have to commit themselves to issue publications all the time about impunity. So mainstream media in general are enemy, don't like to do that because of the political pressure that they have. So this is my answer to your question. And now I would like to <clears throat> go back to the topic of the two demons. In Spain, two arguments have been used for that. First of all, that all the victims of Franco's regime are dead. And this is not said anymore, because everyone knows that everyone has the right to know the truth, to receive reparation, and they have a right to rec of recognition of their uh, suffering, etc., recovery of the uh, cops, etc. But we also know that many victims are still alive. So therefore, that argument, that ground is no longer valid. But then another argument is that at the civil war, both parties killed each other, both parties committed crimes. Well, this is like Mutandi, the two demos in Argentina. The truth is that during the dictatorship, well, during war, there are war crime, crimes War crimes are committed by both parties, but the difference here, here is that there was a democratic party, the democratic government that was assaulted and finished with or terminated with a democratically elected government. So that was the case in Argentina. So therefore, military coup. But also during as they were in power, Franco's regime supporters continued to commit crimes. But also during the dictatorship, they not only 
prosecuted all their enemies, but they also assassinated them, tortured them, made them disappear. It's exactly the same thing as in Argentina. State terrorism, that, that's another element that will be interesting to go deeper in. Universal jurisdiction committed by any sector of the society or by states. I think there has been like a step back when it comes to discuss this topic. And not only because I don't think that these crimes should not be prosecuted, but well, states prosecute these t terrorism crimes. So you don't really need to have a court in a different country prosecuting uh, either the terrorist group but because that is prosecuted in Spain. However, in any case, we have to finish or get away with the idea that state crimes are protected for the fact that those that commit these the, the, the crimes are at the same level as the way, the path to follow. So one more minute for Stella. So she is the person who has has the greatest and longest experience in bringing a, or defending a cause. Who were the key factors, the key players that helped you fight in your struggle and reach the success that you have reached? So one minute, and then we close. We finish here. Well, <clears throat> I would like to invite the El País newspaper to do whatever an Argentina newspaper is doing and has been doing since the end of the sector uh, ship. It publishes on a daily basis the name of the people that are have disappeared and also the names of the and the photographs of the people who are looking for their identity. El País would play an extraordinary role if it were to do that, because undoubtedly many uh, young people would appear, and then everyone would